Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. Everybody, Dr. Mark Sims here. I'm the host of the Listen Up podcast, where I feature top leaders in healthcare. This episode is brought to you by Listen Up Hearing Center. I help patients to effectively treat their hearing loss so they can remain connected to loved ones and friends and remain independent. The reason I am so passionate about hearing loss is because I lost my brother Robbie twice. First, to his hearing loss from radiation to his brain tumor, and then when he passed away. I only care for ears. I'm the E of ENT. I've taken care of tens of thousands of patients with hearing loss and performed over 10,000 ear surgeries over the past 20 years. I'm also the founder of Listen Up Hearing Center. I've written a book of the same name, Listen Up, A Physician's Guide to Effectively Treating Your Hearing Loss. If you want to learn more about that, go to listenuphearing.com. That's listenuphearing.com. Today, we have a great guest, a friend of mine. It's Richard K. Gergel, MD. He's an associate professor of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at University of Utah School of Medicine in Salt Lake City. He's a northern neighbor of mine taking great care of people in that part of the country. His clinical practice focuses on otology, and he's an excellent and busy otologist, performs a full range of surgeries, procedures, and cares for all of the different disorders that otologists such as myself and Dr. Gergel take care of. His research focuses on a really important topic, which is the impact of hearing loss on cognition in older adults. We are here today to talk about his research interest and talk about this exciting topic. I'm really excited to have him on the podcast. Richard, thanks for coming on. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Mark. It's a real pleasure to be here. Looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, this is great. So um, tell me, you know, um, uh, when I told my father I was going to be an otologist, he asked me, am I going to specialize in the right ear or the left ear? He was obviously making light of how uh, specialized it was. So you know, we are in a really kind of specialized area. So how did you end up, uh, you know, ending up in the ears, if you will? Well, that's a great question. You know, I, it's interesting. I, I grew up next to two ENT doctors, and I, I have to think that influenced me in some way just to plant my seed, to let, plant the seed that, it, you know, ENT is actually a thing. But where I got really interested in the ear was uh, my first year of medical school, I had emailed all of the ENT faculty, knowing that I was going this direction. And asked if I could do some research uh, in the um, summer of my, after my first year of medical school. And yeah, yeah. the one who responded was Dr. Clough Shelton, who's an otologist. And he became my mentor. And the first surgery I saw was a cochlear implant surgery. And I, to get ready for that surgery, I watched one of these uh, videos that, you know, it sort of shows a child hearing their mother's voice for the first time. And I was absolutely hooked. I, I thought this is what I want to do. And I, I've been going that direction ever since. That's great. So Dr. Shelton's a, you know, a, a very renowned, well-trained, excellent guy. He trained where I trained. He was a mentor and uh, he is uh, recently retired. He was the chairman of the department, if I recollect. So um, that's awesome to have that. And actually it's great. You know, what a great story. He answered your email, right? I mean, when you really think about it, how, how luck would have it that the person who, um, and um, my other comment about Dr. Shelton, he was very well organized. So I suspect that has something to do with it as well, that he was the one that replied. So I, I think that's great. He had a tremendous impact on my career and all through residency fellowship. And I was fortunate to practice with him for almost a decade. And so he, uh, he was very, very influential in my career. Yeah, that's great. And so uh, probably part of that is so the, the, the first surgery you saw is cochlear implants. I know you have a, a passion for them and an interest from a research point of view. So I know in the intro I said hearing loss and cognition, but I know you've done some work in the area of the, the cochlear implant space. So tell us about the, the research, not just in cognition, but you've done some other uh, research in the cochlear implant space. Well, it's interesting with cochlear implants, this grew out of my interest in this association between hearing loss and cognition. And the question we asked is, if you treat the hearing loss, especially in a group that has really significant, severe to profound hearing loss, are cochlear implant candidates could you make a difference in their cognition? And that led to a study we just published in the past year, looking at this group and trying to answer this question of what happens with a cochlear implant. And cochlear implant, in my opinion, is one of the greatest advances in biomedical engineering that we've seen. We, we can restore a lost neurologic sense, which is just incredible. So a lot of the research I've done is looking at the impact of treating hearing loss and how that affects cognition. But then in addition to that, because oftentimes we're operating on older adults, we've looked at questions of you know, how do we evaluate older adults before they have surgery, whether it's safe to operate on them. 
what's their quality of life, and then uh, what's the quality of life of their caregivers or loved ones, and how does hearing loss actually have a broader impact, not just on those that we're treating, but their whole social circles as well. So that's a, I mean, actually starting bigger, your, your social circle comment. Tell us a little bit about that. Like how, you know, I, I, you know, I know that treating hearing loss will improve people's relationships with their social circles. It's kind of a foregone conclusion. How do you measure that? That's really kind of an interesting topic. Like in other words, what are the ways that you assess it before you do a cochlear implant? And then how afterwards, because I often find the assessment actually gives you insights to the impact, right? Because you're trying to figure out what are the impacts of hearing loss on social circles. So how do you measure that? Can you share that with us, Richard? So it's a good question. How do you measure that? And, you know, in some ways, it's really looking across the room and asking that individual who, who's with the patient, how has hearing loss affected your life? Or, or how is this intervention that we've done, a, a cochlear implant or even treating with hearing aids, how does that impact you? And you know, I always say to my patients, if you really want to know if they have hearing loss, ask their spouse or their significant other, because they're the ones who will really tell you what it's like day to day and what their interactions are like. I would say it's the grandchildren, because the grandchildren, the grandchildren are totally honest. They don't, they don't have the social filters to not be nice. <laughs> They'll just say, yeah, grandpa can't hear. <laughs> but anyway. Absolutely. So, you know, in one way, there's just this qualitative assessment. In the study we did, there, we used actually a questionnaire called the SOS here significant other scale for hearing disability. And it asks a number of questions of, you know, does uh, your loved one's hearing loss bother you? And uh, just questions like that, or what bothers you the most? Turning up the volume on the TV, uh, you know, just different day-to-day -day interactions they may have. So that's a validated survey uh, that we used with a number of different uh, domains within the survey, communication burden, relationship changes, going out, socializing, emotional reactions, concern for their partner. And, uh, and we actually sent this survey out to the uh, caregivers of our older cochlear implant patients. And so we published a paper about that. But it's interesting that, that when you treat hearing loss, it really does have a broader effect than just on the recipient uh, who's being treated. I actually say uh, the people who love it the most are usually your spouse because they have to no longer, you know, tell you what the specials are, no longer have to interact with the waiter or waitress, no longer have to interact with the cashier, answer the phone, answer the door, deal with all the tradesmen who maybe do home repairs. All of that stuff just falls on the hearing, uh, the better or either the better hearing or less hearing impaired uh, member of a couple. Absolutely, 100%. And, you know, it, over time, that takes its toll, I think, on the relationship. And so... Yeah. It, it is really refreshing to be able to see someone's hearing improve and, and all of these aspects of their life get better as well. And so um, I know the outcome, but can you tell the audience what, what your study found? Yeah, so what we found um, basically to summarize was that there were a number of different domains that improved significantly uh, when at looking at this, the spouse and significant others. Um, so a couple of very specific areas um, were uh, the change in hearing. So as the hearing improved, the self-reported quality of life scores also improved quite a bit. Um, interestingly, some of the quality of life scores didn't necessarily correlate with how, how well they were hearing as far as their absolute measurements with the score. Um, so we took a patient's, uh, you know, their ability, their scores to hear, and that didn't always necessarily correlate with the improvement that we saw with the spouse. So what, what we learned is that um, all of the domains seemed to improve a fair bit. And there were high, higher quality of life scores were found among caregivers if the patient or recipient was healthier and if they were female as well. That was one of our findings. So our, our female cochlear implant patients, uh, their male uh, spouses or counterparts, um, actually that their quality of life improved the most it seemed like yeah that might have to do with roles in terms of uh within the couple of i mean the interesting thing is it doesn't surprise me that um some patients didn't see their own quality go up because i think uh some patients underappreciate their speech reading and, and uh cognitive or uh, contextual processing component of communication so they might not think they communicate as better as much improved after the ci as it, as a cochlear implant as it really is I, I agree completely. I mean, people are not necessarily good at uh, assessing their own impairment. That's a fascinating, it's a different topic. But uh, so, and so 
Um, you know, and then yeah, it sounds like uh, I mean, what we would all expect would be by and large, people are uh, the caregivers are happier when they can communicate more effectively with their own uh, significant other and that their significant other can communicate with others more too. That's the other impact, right? And so, absolutely. and then so yeah, I know you've done some work with CI and cognition as well. And so, what to tell us about that work, Richard. Yeah, so that was a, a project. It's been many years ago that we started it, but we decided we wanted to invite any of our patients who are 65 and older to participate in this study in which we would test their cognitive function before surgery, six months and 12 months after surgery. And I worked with a neuropsychologist to put together a battery of, of uh, cognitive tests. We did 10 tests total. These tests took about an hour. So in a busy clinical practice, this wouldn't have been practical, but under a research protocol, we really wanted to find out sure. you know, what's getting better and, and what's improving. So our tests, we had some tests that were visually based tests, meaning that the test mainly had uh, visual instructions and, and different things to do visually, the cognitive test. Then we had five verbally based tests for these individuals. And we um, enrolled about 60 patients uh, uh, initially, and we had a total data set on about 37 patients that we reported on. And took it to the end, basically, right? That's right, that, that we're able to complete all the testing. Part of the reason why we did this, the largest and, and uh, fastest growing segment of cochlear implant recipients are older adults. Sure. Uh, we have an aging population. And when you look at census data about predictions of what our population will look like in 10, 20, 30 years, there's a big shift toward the older end of our age spectrum where birth rates have remained pretty stagnant or even declining, yet our older population, this is the group that's really growing. And- You know, for our listeners, they might not realize this, but the incidence of people becoming cochlear implant candidates is higher than the incidence of implantation. That's exactly right. There, there's We're a- getting a larger pool, which in most diseases, that would be called an epidemic. That's a very good point. And it's interesting because only about 10% of older adults who are even candidates by all of our traditional criteria are actually getting this intervention. I think that speaks to what you're just mentioning is there's this group of candidates growing and uh, you know we may not be meeting the need. So we, we really wanted to focus on this population. Um, but what we found is with this group of 37 patients that we were able to uh, see through to the end, their hearing improved as we expect. They went on average from needing about 78 decibels to hear down to 31 decibels and 25 decibels is our threshold for normal. It's about the sound of a whispered voice. And then their speech comprehension scores went from about 22% on average before surgery to 72% after surgery. So that, that's the part that was no surprise to us. We expected their hearing to get better. You're basically saying proving that cochlear implants work. Co cochlear implants work. Which we all know, so, but it's yes. good to have a study that says it too, right? Yeah, it's, it's nice to see that. And then what we looked at is all of these different cognitive tests. And what we found is almost across the board on all of these tests, our patients were showing significant improvement uh, when we compared before surgery to after surgery. And uh, these different tests, uh, the names of them, their digit span tests, the trail making tests where you have to connect different dots in a certain order, a color word test where you're presented a color visually, but you have to say a different word. So these all test different um, domains of cognition, like attention, learning and memory, executive function. Um, but one interesting finding, Mark, that we had is we, we took all comers, we recruited all of our older patients. Right. And as you can imagine with this group, there was actually a group that had some impaired cognition to begin with. Yeah, I was about to say, what was your baseline incidence of uh, meaning your your pre-implant, What how how prevalent was co cognitive issues? So those cognitive issues were in about 35% of patients. So about a third of the patients Absolutely. already had some baseline impairment. And interestingly, it was that group that improved the most. Uh, they, they showed the greatest magnitude of improvement on these different tests. So when we look at the whole group uh, across the board, we saw improvement, but specifically looking at this group and comparing them to the normal cognition at baseline, the group that was lower actually improved the most. So I think what this study showed, there's a real opportunity we have to not only improve hearing for older adults, but actually protect the brain and, and improve brain function and cognition. Yeah. And so that, that's great. That's wonderful. I mean, I think probably 
Um, you know, I mean, one of the ways to think about it is the increased cognitive load of trying to compensate for your hearing loss, you know, uh, after a while will take its toll. And so reversing that on the ones that it's already taken the toll, because it's kind of an, something that you can reverse, right, as compared to other cognitive issues. But that, that, that's, that's amazing. And so what were the domains that uh, people saw the most improvement in, Richard? Do you remember? So we saw it, um, the biggest uh, improvements were, and I'll mention the four specific tests, the hailing sentence test, D2 test of attention, trail making test B, and then the brief visual spatial memory test. And those tests, those different domains, um, the hailing, is, hailing test is a test of executive function as well as trail making. So that, that was something we definitely saw some improvement on. And then the learning and memory uh, domain as well. So when you say executive function, can you help define that? Because I think that that's a term thrown around in the cognitive space. Uh, when you know when you talk to people about screening and all that, they talk about executive function. But what does that mean for the listeners? Well, executive function is really kind of those higher order functions of just day to day living, paying the bills on time, uh, you know, making sure appointments are met, keeping organized your schedule and those different things. That's really what we talk about with executive function. Because that's a complex, much more complex task than um, matching a color, a written color to a color on a sheet, right? Because it's multi, really keeping an appointment has many, many multiple steps. I mean, we all think it's just keep the appointment, but there's, you know, remember that you have it, know how to get there, look at the clock, look, you know, calculate how long it takes you to get there, know how to drive there, know how to park, how to get it. There's a lot of many, many things. So that's what they mean because it's a multi-step process. Am I correct about that? That's correct. I think that's a good summary of it. Yeah. And so that's amazing, right? Because it, again, it's, it's, you're, you're seeing that people are more functional as a, you know, at post-implantation than a pre-implantation. So do you use those screens still in your process to, for all comers, or is this is this is the study still open? So we are. We're now. It's interesting. We we started this actually five years ago. I can't believe it's been that much time because we just published this. But it takes a while to recruit yeah, these man. patients and get them through the whole testing paradigm. We are now bringing these patients back for their five year testing. Uh, uh, those uh, that are right. available to do that. So, but that is still under our research protocol in the clinical world. We have recently adopted a, a relatively quick screener. It doesn't go through in as much depth as these other tests, but it's called the Cognaview screener. And you use it in your practice, do you? We are, we're giving that a try. We just recently acquired it. Um, I don't have any financial conflicts of interest with the group. Um, Me neither, but, but just, we've talked to multiple people involved in Cognaview on this podcast. So, Yeah, and so we, we've, we have that in our clinic. We've started using it, and um, we're just you know, measuring the effect that has and, and how does it affect clinic flow? And, um, you know, is it something we can incorporate? What do we do with the test results as well? That's always a question if you're going to- I think that question is a huge one, right? I mean, yeah. we agree. I mean, you know, what, one of the issues, uh, Richard, is, you know, what do you do with a positive screen? So the, the system, meaning the healthcare delivery system, I'm not sure how ready it is for uh, a many patients who perhaps will now be screened who will have some sort of positive and what do you actually do with them in terms of the follow-up? Because they don't go right to a neurologist that deals with dementia and cognitive issues. You probably have an intermediary step. So it'll be interesting. What are you guys doing as your intermediary step? It's a good question. And we ask that with any screening question, whether it's screening for older adult or age-related hearing loss, or in this case, cognition. But you know, it depends on how they score, but basically we're sending them back to their primary care providers as the, the initial, um, you know, sort of frontline uh, healthcare professionals to be able to evaluate this. And it's true. I, I've worked closely with our director of our Alzheimer's uh, center, and, and they actually won't see patients until they've been worked up by their primary care doctor, just because so much of that can be taken care of in the primary care setting. Um, so that, that's how we're approaching that. Oh, that's great. That's great. And so um, do you, so I, I'll just say we, we've been doing the MOCA for about six or seven years now um, for not because of the research, just because we thought we had some patients who were saying they were failures who actually had cognitive issues. So we want to start measuring it. It's a little bit harder, but you know, we found that it's been a, a reasonable screen, but I don't know about the cognitive view. We, we are not utilizing that yet. Yeah, I think time will tell. And there are a number of different ways. Any screening tool, you know, what you want is it to have it be very sensitive and, and pick up, you know, potentials, even if you have some false positives. But 
you want to pick up those individuals who are at risk, and then you can refer them on for more specific uh, specialized testing. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I mean, uh, you know, talking about bigger issues in terms of hearing screening, I think, you know, that's a, a big issue too, is just there isn't good hearing screening overall for hearing loss. Well, on that, uh, it's, it's interesting. I was a chair of the American Academy of Otolaryngology uh, Age-Related Hearing Loss Cl Clinical Practice Group or Measurement Development Group. We published a paper recommending screener talking about how to screen older adults with hearing loss on the exact same day. This was purely coincidental, uh, but it just happened to be the same day in March um, earlier this year from the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force when they also came to the conclusion that there was no recommendation to screen because the evidence just is not out there to do screening for age-related hearing loss. And there are a couple of nuances to that. The uh, U.S. Preventative Service Task Force looked at adults 50 Literature. years and older and, and recommended no screening in that group. But I think to me, what that just said as a field, we have some work to do to demonstrate that if you do screening, that it actually makes a difference for individuals. And, and some nuance to that. Did they say no screening or no, there was not enough evidence to support screening? Not enough evidence. So it wasn't a recommendation against screening. It was no recommendation, meaning that we just aren't there yet with the evidence base to make a formal recommendation. Yeah, I think the other issue is, is even if they do get screened, the hearing rehabilitation outcomes are not very good. So, um, you know, if you find the disease, I'm not sure the disease is well treated enough to justify the screening, which is kind of an irony. And that's an important point. With any screening paradigm, you have to demonstrate that screening will lead to increased detection of disease, that increased detection of disease will lead to increased treatment. And that increased treatment ultimately leads to better outcomes. And so the, each of those three steps has to be met. And I think that's kind of where the future of our field is, at least in the near term, is that, you know, hopefully we can demonstrate those things. Well, I think actually uh, the thing that's interesting is, is, is um, you know, at least from my experience, I think the cochlear implantation stuff is relatively um, uh, robust. You know, I think the rehabilitation with amplification or hearing aids is robust, but that's all predicated on the uh, uh, hearing aid meeting prescriptive targets. And so it's not that a well-fitted hearing aid isn't good, it's that there are so many poorly fitted hearing aids. Yeah, I completely agree. And that I'm hoping that technology will improve quite a bit and uh, you know that we'll see better hearing aids at lower price points uh, so that more individuals can be treated. Yeah, no, I, I yes, uh, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I know many people talk about price point, but Europe doesn't necessarily show us that price point leads to increased adoption. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see, uh, just for the listeners, the over-the-counter uh, hearing aid market is emerging right now. So we'll see what that does. Um, but I, I think you're going to have to show, uh, it is possible, unfortunately, that over-the-counter hearing aid could show worse outcomes. Yeah, that'll be very interesting to follow over time. So what, what, what is a foot to be able to assess these things? I mean, you know, in terms of, you know, I know you worked on the age-related hearing loss measurement. Um, I read the article and it went over all the different current um, uh, screening technologies, even uh, finger rub and uh, all of these other. I actually saw a patient today whose primary care doctor did a finger rub and told her she didn't have any hearing loss when she had a significant hearing loss. Oh, is that right? But, but the reality is, is we know that finger rub isn't very reliable. So um but that being said, where do you see the work going in this respect? Well, what I would love to see in an ideal world is that in a primary care setting, so reaching a broad patient population, anyone who's potentially at risk, either due to age or prior noise exposure, gets some sort of screening. And you know, even just the question, do you have hearing loss? If someone answers yes to that question, chances are they probably do have hearing loss. Yeah, that can be an effective screener and low cost, uh, very easy to administer. But there are more uh, in-depth screening tools like um, validated surveys, the Hearing Handicapped Index. Um, I think nowadays with technology as well, you know, we each carry a supercomputer in our pocket. And I'm, I'm amazed actually that on an iPhone, for example, you can look under the health app and see how much volume you've been exposed to. So maybe there's a, a role for technology to be able to tell a user you know, you're really turning up the volume pretty loud and uh, you should be tested for your hearing loss. I think that but in an ideal world, the primary care setting, there's some tool that, or instrument that we have to identify when someone's at risk 
and then they can get referred on to more formal diagnostic testing. Yeah, yeah, no, it's interesting though. You know, I did a little bit of a deep dive on those uh, surveys. One of the things that's fascinating is that a lot of the work shows that they do measure whether or not people perceive their hearing loss or not, but they actually don't correlate with the audiogram. Mm -hmm. So, meaning that, you know, you could have a significant hearing loss and not assess your handicap. So yes or no, if you have a handicap correlates with hearing loss, but it doesn't necessarily the degree that you assess your handicap doesn't correlate with the degree of hearing loss you have, which is a fascinating concept. Yeah. Yeah. That, that gets into so many potential other issues with how people perceive their illness and right. different things, but, uh, well, I would say you don't know what you don't hear. So I don't know if you're actually a good person to know whether or not you have hearing loss. Yeah, that's a great point to make. So, and, and so um, that, that's one issue, obviously. And so where are you going forward with the cochlear implant work, Richard? So right now we have a study where uh, we're looking at whether or not cochlear implants actually protect against Alzheimer's disease. We, we've done this prospective study where we've looked at it and we've seen improved cognition but what if we project ahead 5, 10, 15 years? We're using a large database uh, here at the University of Utah called the Utah Population Database. It has over 11 million records in it, and wow. it's a multi-generational database where we can follow individuals prospectively over time. And so we have a, an NIH grant that is allowing us to look at a cohort of older adults who get cochlear implants, or just over 600 of them, and then we're following them through this database over time to see who develops dementia, and we're comparing them to older adults who are all matched based on their age, then their gender, other cardiovascular risk factors, and we're looking at that group who has hearing loss but no cochlear implant to see what their rates of dementia are. And uh, we have some very preliminary results that are exciting, but we haven't done a lot of the statistical analysis on it. I'm hoping to be able to present that soon, but that, that's kind of where we're at right now. My hunch is going to show it's worse and people aren't treated. That's our hunch and that's our hypothesis, but we need the data to be able to see Agreed. it. And then also to really describe the magnitude of benefit as well. Right. Well, that's the other thing. You're saying, yes, it's better is one thing. It's another thing. Yes, it's better by whatever that quantitative expression is a whole other thing. Right. And I think that's important because then you can perhaps communicate that to policymakers and patients like, no, it's not just that it improves it, it improves it to whatever measure. So that, that's really great work. And I look forward to you getting that out by tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, that would be great. These things take a lot of time for the audience to understand, like these concepts and these things that uh, Richard's talking about sound like, you know, oh yeah, of course, but just the work of collecting um, multiple examinations on 37 patients, if it takes an hour, you have to figure that's, you know, 40 hours for each time for each patient times. So it's, you know, three man weeks of effort, let alone just to collect the data and everything. I mean, these are tremendously and getting people to come in and all that, the, the work and to get this good data is amazing work. It's great work, but it's actually hard work. I'm not sure it, 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 unless you've tried it, people, it, it seems, it sounds easier than it is. Let's put it that way. Well, it, it's fun. You learn a lot, you know, about our patients and uh, how to help them along some of the challenges they face as well. So it's, it's worthwhile. I enjoy it. That's wonderful. So what type of uh, interesting questions do you think you'll be trying to answer over the next five to 10 years? I mean, what, what's this, where do you see this all going? Well, you know, the, we, I think we're at a point now where we know there's a strong association between hearing loss and dementia. And that's started with George Gates, the University of Washington. Franklin, I have to mention, because he's been such a phenomenal leader in this space and really bringing this to the public's awareness, providing the data, being an excellent spokesperson and Frank's work has really just been so innovative. And when we've looked now at multiple data sets, uh, large population databases, I think there's no question about this concept that hearing loss is a real risk factor for dementia. And the Lancet uh, published two articles to this effect that yeah. um, hearing loss may be the number one risk factor for dementia, modifiable risk factor. Right, modifiable in, the, in so, your adult life, right? Because that's there's right. Like so in answer to your question, where do I see kind of this going? The golden question that we still need to answer is if you treat the hearing loss, will it actually affect those risks for dementia? And, and we feel like it will, but there again, we really need that data, whether it's cochlear implants or even with hearing aids. And that's, I know uh, Dr. Lin is uh, engaged in this Eric um, uh, study where 
you know, large, large study looking at hearing aids in one group versus uh, personal sound amplifiers in a control group and seeing really the impact of, of hearing aids or treating hearing loss on cognition. And whether that's a hearing aid or a cochlear implant, I think that's really the question that we need to answer. And, and it'll be nice that, you know, in multiple different centers can do this prospectively or from different data sets. I think that's where we're really going to move the needle on this. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, I don't disagree with you that that's not great work. Um, it's an interesting threshold that people, because I mean, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with saying that, you know, it makes sense, right? But, you know, when you look historically, uh, medicine started treating high blood pressure in the 1950s. And it wasn't until the early 1970s that the Sentinel article come out indicating that reducing high blood pressure reduced myocardial infarction. And mm -hmm. so it, it's amazing how much faster we want things to move along. But for those 20 years, we were treating hypertension absent the data. So um, it's kind of an interesting thing that I think we could probably go ahead and then, because we know even if you treat them, people are doing better, maybe not a, a direct, but I, I, but I do think from a policy point of view, it's wonderful data and, and great to have. So it'll be great when that stuff comes out. And, and that's where it's important is once we have that data, then, you know, going to the CMS, Center for Medicare Services or private insurers to say, you know, this really should be incorporated in your coverage plan. There should be incentives for, um, you know, your population to be able to get a hearing aid, uh, for example, because we know what a, a big difference it can make for people. Yeah, no, it's all great. Well, this is really um, amazing, wonderful work you're doing. And I really appreciate your efforts, um, you know, that you're moving the field forward in uh, this area, because I think it's a really important uh, research area. And I really appreciate you talking to our listeners about it. Um, uh, Richard, if if you were um, accepting a Lifetime Achievement Award and you were to thank people, who who would you thank for getting you to where you are today? Well, first and foremost would be my own uh, spouse, my wife, Christy, who's uh, just been a remarkable, she's the eternal optimist and, and always just such a great support. And of course, my family, my parents, my dad was an immigrant and went to college just so he could learn English and it totally changed his world. Education became very important for our family. So that, that'd be first and foremost, of course. But, you know, I, I've had so many important mentors. Um, Dr. Shelton, I mentioned my residency and working with two phenomenal neurotologists, Dr. Bruce Gantz, Marlon Hansen, um, who really shaped me. And then my fellowship director, Dr. Rob Jackler at Stanford with Nick Blevins and John Ogle, who were two other of our neurotology faculty. And, you know, I, I really believe in this concept. We stand on the shoulders of giants and um, our mentors play a, a really important role for us. In, and then we have research mentors and, and there are thought leaders in our field who also propel us forward. And, um, but personally for me, those are the individuals who have had the biggest impact. That's great. They're all uh, excellent contributors and amazing people have done wonderful things to move our field forward. So I it sounds like you've been fortunate to have multiple excellent mentors. Richard, what, what's your favorite sound? I mean, we are in the world of sound. So what's your favorite sound? The sound of my wife's voice. So that's nice. <laughs> yeah, I love, love talking with my wife and hearing her laugh and uh, there's nothing that beats that. No, oh, that's, that's really wonderful. Um, so if people wanted to get a hold of you, uh, talk to you more, learn more about you, how would they find you? So uh, Gergel is not a common name. And so <laughs> there aren't many of us out there. If you type in Richard Gergel, Utah, um, a Google search will take you to my landing page through the University of Utah. I'm absolutely happy to have people reach out directly. My email's on every card that I give my patients. I want to be accessible to them. So richard.gergel, G-U-R-G-E-L at hsc.utah.edu. HSC is Health Science Center. Uh, so hsc.utah.edu, but happy to take uh, email, um, re reach me through my office as well. Uh, but no, I, I love talking about this. I, I think just like you, Mark, I'm passionate about hearing and uh, we'll jump at any opportunity to talk about these things. No, it's wonderful. It's a fascinating topic and it's moving along and uh, so impactful to everybody's life um, and a, a, what I would call a hidden illness that really needs to be brought out to be discussed and uh, really, uh, the care level needs to be elevated. I mean, I think there's great stuff, but it's also applying it well and really getting people dialed into being treated as best as possible is a huge thing, I think. Like what you mentioned there, a hidden illness. You know, I think for so often, for so long, hearing loss in older adults has just been associated with normal aging. You know, it, it's so interesting how we treat hearing loss in children, the exact same degree of hearing loss, let's say a 35, 40 decibel hearing loss in a child 
that child would have special education and hearing aids. There would be all these resources. Right. We see that same level of hearing loss in an adult, yeah, 35 like, ah, decibels. Well. We may say, oh, you're doing great for a you know, 70, 80, 90 year old. So it's very interesting. I think we need to move past that. It's not just part of normal aging. I think treating that hearing loss is part of healthy aging. And uh, we can do a lot of good by identifying that and helping older adults to stay connected with their environment. And uh, whether it's cognitively, socially, all these different things, uh, treating hearing loss is really a big deal. Yeah, no, I, 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 when patients say it's not that bad, I always go, what's a little bit of high blood pressure? Yeah, exactly. Right? So, I mean, there is no such thing as a little bit of hearing loss. It, it is, and it's a medical problem that needs to be addressed. So we could probably go on. This is a great conversation. I really appreciate your time, Richard. Um, this is uh, Dr. Richard Gurgel. He is a associate professor at uh, the University of Utah. He is uh, the director of their uh, otology, neurotology section and obviously an excellent and passionate researcher in hearing loss. And this has been a, a great pleasure to have you on uh, the podcast, which thank you so much for coming on. And uh, I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Mark. It's a real pleasure. And, and thanks for being such a leader as well in, in doing these types of podcasts and educational activities. Oh, sure. My pleasure. I really enjoy it. Thanks again. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.